get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of P90X, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25 hosts in-person VIP events and masterminds for top entrepreneurs all over the country. We hosted events this past year in Austin, Chicago, Santa Barbara, San Diego, New York, Sonoma, Vegas, more. I know we were there, uh, Carrie and LA in Vegas at the same time, but we didn't see each other, unfortunately. Um, If you see the value of immersing yourself with other top entrepreneurs to connect and collaborate to get your business to the next level, go to rise25.com, contact us, find out where our next event is going to be. And today I'm very excited. We have the co-founders of Safe Sleeve, Carrie Subal and Alay Kumar, who are both industrial engineers from Cal Poly. Safe Sleeve is a manufacturer of radiation blocking laptop and phone cases and accessories. Uh, their distribution includes major retailers in the U.S. on Amazon, Walmart.com, Jet.com, along with Safe Sleeve's website and distributors in Europe, Australia, and Singapore. Carrie Nalay, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having us. I want to get into the journey, you know, you have an interesting journey, why you started the idea, but I wanted to start off and talk a little bit about the research, Um, you know, because people hear all sorts of tales of radiation causing this and that, people don't know what to believe. Um, What are some of the recent studies? What are they talking about with with radiation? I mean, I've I've even watched some YouTube videos where, again, like that's not science, I want to hear some of the research, but where they have some kind of EMF reader and they like walk across the room and it's still going off from this computer and that freaked me out so tell me what's out there with the with the actual research and not me watching youtube videos uh, with people with emf readers well to that point there's definitely you know it's a hotly debated topic right now um there's a lot of anecdotal evidence on both sides but the actual science behind it um The most recent study that's been done, and this was the largest scale study that's been done to date, it was actually a government funded study. They spent $25 million of taxpayers' funds to conduct a two year study and expose rats to. They better have found something if they spent our money on it, right? (laughs) (laughs) So they exposed uh, rats to cell phone radiation. and they exposed them for the course of two years and thousands of rats. And the two years is supposed to simulate the lifespan of a human. Okay. Um, and, you know, that's pretty typical to use rats in a, in a study, like to see the effects of, you know, something might have right. on human beings. Okay. So, no animals anyway, are harmed in this video, but, but you're yes. Well, unfortunately, some were. <laughs> <laughs> Not in this particular um, video, but in, in the research, yes. It, yeah, oh, yeah. exactly. Um, so, what they found was in increased increased rates of heart cancer, stomach cancer, and a certain type of malignant brain cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, actually, I should rewind a little bit. Those are the studies that came out that were actually being kind of buried for years. Um, and the cell phone industry was spending millions in lobbyists yeah, and I'm lawsuits sure. trying, to, yeah. trying to bury the results of the studies. Um, and eventually, the government was sued uh, the organization that conducted the study was sued to release the results of the study because, after all, it's publicly funded and the results should be public. So hmm. this went through lawsuit after lawsuit. Um, eventually, it was won and the studies were to be released. The results of the studies were to be released. Um, it even went through an appeals process. Again, the cell phone industry is fighting it and spending millions in court trying to get it squashed. And it went all the way to, to the California Superior Court and eventually it was decided that it had to, the publicly results had to be released. And that's when we found out that there were actually were increased cancer rates in these rats. So what do um, people do? Obviously, there's cases like yours. What else? Do, I mean, people aren't going to stop talking on the phone or using computers or using iPads. What else have you found that w- is helpful? So the recommendations typically, I mean, here's the thing. 
a lot of the recommendations you'll, you'll read are along the lines of what you're saying. Just, you know, oh, just don't talk on your phone as much. Unrealistic. So um, something like using speakerphone is going to be helpful. Uh, the biggest thing with a, an electronic device, especially a wireless electronic device, which is going to emit radio frequency radiation and lower frequencies from the electronic itself, uh, the biggest thing is the distance. So if you keep the device as far away as possible, um, you know, my computer right now is two feet away from us. Uh, typically, you're going to see extremely... <laughs> That's why you're on the other side of the room. You're like, <laughs> exactly. here's my computer. <laughs> yeah. This thing is right. emitting radiation see... at me. <laughs> so there's a big drop off. It's it's an exponential decay rate. So as soon as you pass kind of a threshold of where that where mm -hmm. that radiation kind of bubble is, it falls off drastically. It's exponential. So um, as long as you keep kind of a safe distance, you're okay. The thing is, realistically, how bad are I mean, Bluetooth okay. headsets? Bluetooth still does use radio frequency, and it's an electronic device. So while it's maybe not the same power as your cell phone, um, it's still you know on your on your head, right next to your brain, constantly. Yeah. Um, so we definitely don't recommend Bluetooth devices. Um, you know, a cell phone. It's easy to say just use speakerphone, hold it out here. Who does that? Every you know, it's designed to yeah. hold it up to your ear. A laptop is called a laptop for a reason. It's designed to be put on your lap. A uh, tablet, same thing. So, yeah. Um, you know, we wanted to develop a solution that basically you don't have to compromise the functionality yeah. of your device. It's still gonna be I mean, it's sort of a game. scary topic because um, kids are using these devices younger and younger. And so you see like a two or three year old watching a movie for two hours on an iPad with it right in front of their face. And it's, you know, the effects, we don't even know what the effects will be like, you know? So, exactly. So, sh you know, I, I mean, I have predictions. I've, I remember reading an article years ago, five or six years ago, of, a, you know, a brain surgeon talking about the radiation of, of this stuff. So, you know, it's, it's out there. Um, so why did this come across your radar, right? You guys are... Um, industrial engineers at Cal Poly, you know, people care about women, beer. I don't know. Why did you care about radiation at that time? <laughs> well, the engineers didn't have time for the beer and the women. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but sorry, just to rewind real quick before I, before I answer that, because um, your point about children is a really good point. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, there's actually a warning in, in your iPhone. And our iPhones so out of the out of the spectrum of phones, where does that fall? Is it higher emitting or is it in the middle? Obviously, a lot of people use use iPhones. I don't actually have an iPhone, surprisingly, but um, I have a BlackBerry. But um, where does the iPhone fall? It's typically like their give or take going to be you know pretty similar. They're similar. Um, there are. You know, versus like an Android device or something like that. Um, yeah. I would say that it's almost, it's not that there isn't a difference. It's just more so that all the same concepts apply. So whether you're using an Android or an iPhone, you should still use the same, you know, practices to kind of reduce right. your exposure. Um, but so uh, there is a setting in, in the iPhone, or it's not a setting, it's a warning within the settings that's like buried deep within the settings um, of the RF exposure. And Android devices have it too. And if it's not in the phone itself, it's in the manual that came with the phone that you know no one ever reads. Right. Um, and the reason why I bring it up to your point about kids is the warning basically says that you, you could be exceeding FCC regulation limits for radiation if you have the device directly on your body. Hmm. So that brings up a couple points. One is that, you know, obviously most people have the device directly on their body, whether it's in their pocket or they're, they're holding it up to their head. Um, the other thing is those FCC regulations that you're exceeding were based off a model that was simulating a 200 pound male and so those mm -hmm. regulations were set based on a 200 pound fully grown male. And those regulations were set, I think back in 94 and they haven't been touched since. So your point about children, I mean, you know, obviously whatever the exposure is for a 200 pound male, it's just exponentially exaggerated when it right. comes to a developing right. child. Uh, totally. So, and so then, do you want to talk to? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was just gonna see if you want to talk to um, 
your question about how we kind of came up with the idea. Yeah, it yeah. seems random. Uh, it is in unless a, one I mean, of your parents is like a brain surgeon and you're like we're seeing a lot of tumors in cell phone cases but how did you come up right. with this idea right so uh, so basically in college as anyone else in college you're constantly on your laptop for homework for assignments so on and so forth so that's kind of where we we started noticing where a lot of our classmates and other individuals are on their devices all the time and Carrie had an experience with a friend or... Yeah, not my parents, but my friend's dad was a neurologist, actually, mm. to your point. So he told me, uh, you know, don't use your laptop on your lap. My dad says, like, it's bad for you. And it was just always kind of in the back of my mm. mind. And then mm -hmm. and I kind of told away and, you know. So that's kind of where we started. Instead of, instead of studying for finals as we should have been, uh, we were developing, uh, you know, we did some initial research to see what was out there, to see if there's any other partners in the market. Um, and a lot of the things that we're seeing was similar to what we discussed previously, which is just keep the device away from you, which is not going to work if you're trying to get an A in a class. Right. So, um, so we, and there were a couple of products on the market. They just weren't, uh, let's say, aesthetically pleasing. We knew that the people around us weren't going to be willing to use that device because of that case or that product because it didn't look very good. So that's the very initial stages of Safe Sleeve, and, and that's kind of how it started. Yeah, and so then at what point... Because, you know, we all have ideas. Some come, some go. At what point do you decide to actually pursue this? Because you guys ended up um, doing a crowdfunding campaign to start, right? Yes, we actually did two crowdfunding campaigns. Um, initially, in the beginning, it was really just a lot of uh, testing, R&D for the shielding material, um, kind of figuring out what compositions work, what didn't, as well, and it's also looking at kind of weight. There's... If you remember, like, if you go to the dentist and they put that big lead right, um, right, totally. blanket over you, something like you that. You should have one as a piece. joke just on your, selling on your right. shop. Like, right. just, or just wear this lead vest. We'll ship it to you. Yeah, It'll be $1,000. Exactly. Um, so something like that for, you know, numerous reasons, whether it be the lead, whether it be the weight. Wasn't How did you get access part. to test the materials? Is it because of the lab at Cal Poly or are you ordering them? Uh, that testing happened actually out, out uh, after Cal Poly. So mm. we did it outside of uh, Cal Poly. Yeah, it was a third-party lab that we found that specialized in testing this type of equipment. Um, and we had to test in-house hundreds of hundreds of different materials. To, Combination like, of yeah, materials. And different like specific combinations of metals and things like that to uh, find the right formula to block radiation from a device effectively how we wanted to um, and it's it's crazy what we found is basically you can have a trace element that's like 0.3 percent of the composition mm. if you change that to 0.2 percent it all of a sudden doesn't effectively wow. block radiation or not even a little bit so it's a super specific composition it's interesting and so how long did that take you to develop um, for you to actually develop I'm assuming like some proprietary you know, actually formula that blocks radiation that you put into the cases or accessories? Uh, I think for, for the initial, for the initial, let's say, release of product, right? Because, you know, as we continue to move on, we released the first one and we knew that we could make it better, but we knew that we were, you know, 99% of the way there. So we continue to tweak and improve as time went on, but the first one was what, maybe like a year, year and a half? At least, yeah. Yeah. So at what point in the journey do you decide, okay, we're going to put this up on uh, and do a crowdfunding campaign? Pretty much when we got the first prototype. So it all started with the laptop case. Um, and that was because, you know, I had this friend who told me, don't use your laptop on your lap. We all had cell phones, but it wasn't as big of a part of our lives at that point, which was, you know, 2007. Let's say. Right. Um, and... So we got the first prototype for the laptop case, which was a journey in itself. Um, once we had the shielding technology, we were like, So you okay, did the great. first prototype um, before you did the crowdfunding? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a functioning prototype, um, and we made a video. That's, that was pretty much our... We wanted to get to the point where we had a functioning prototype, which that's kind of what they, I think, require now pretty much. On yeah, a, on a crowdfunding. back then they didn't, I don't think. I don't think you needed a... Yeah, functional. I think Indiegogo, you know, is a little looser on their requirements. Kickstarter, I think it was right around the time that we launched 
that they decided that you have to have a functioning prototype. It could be CGI or yeah. anything like that. So, How much did it um, cost so to actually develop this prototype? Because I imagine it went through a lot of iterations, a lot of research. What's kind of the ballpark of what you had to invest? Because at this point, you don't have a product, uh, one you could sell. And yeah. so you're investing time. You don't know if it's going to work. Right, so it's it's a time investment and money investment. Yeah, are we counting the legal fees? <laughs> yes, definitely. Because that, I mean, that was maybe the biggest chunk. Really? Um, yeah, just you know the IP process. Like we wanted to, you know, going into it, like trying to get trying to get this patented before we even hit the market. Um, yeah, so legal fees for sure. <laughs> yeah, ballpark. What are we talking? Before we got it on Kickstarter, we we're probably looking at probably 20, 20 grand. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So we were and we were bootstrapped. So we were working. We we're both working full time jobs um, right out of college and self funding it. Where is the the patent process at now? You still... so we have patents. We have patents pending on our on our cell phone cases um, and the laptop case as long ago as we launched, believe it or not, still going through the process. <laughs> is that it's technology, long, long process. is that technology, um, can be used in other means like on, in clothing, other things? For this particular combination that we're using, no. Um, so again, for us, we were, we were looking for, for this particular application, what's a, a solution that would give us the highest level of protection and for that reason there's certain things like it's not it's not a fabric yeah kind of, it's you know, not flexible you know, kind of woven. right which those do exist um, but they just don't have to block radiation as effectively yeah totally uh, so that. you launch it on Indiegogo what happens yeah, it was a while ago. What happened? <laughs> well, we were successful. We pretty because you did two just, times. Why two? We did two times. Yeah. Yeah. So the first time was the laptop case, mm -hmm. and we we pretty much squeaked by in the eleventh hour and and hit our goal, which was awesome. Um, and so we were able to. We already had our supply chain lined up and everything, so we were able to use those funds to get the order in, and we delivered pretty much on schedule, and our customers were happy. That's probably rare. Uh, yeah. And pretty similar with the Kickstarter, right? So, so we did a Kickstarter. You did a Kickstarter. Well, so initially an Indiegogo for the laptop case, and then a year and a half later, mm -hmm. we did the cell phone case um, on Kickstarter. So what did you learn? So, what did you do differently the second time around? Because you probably learned well, some things. I'd say one of the biggest things is, um, this is just the first thing that stands out to me, aside from, you know, Everything, <laughs> like more did everything. Uh, we uh, what what was the um, what was I gonna say now? <laughs> oh, the the outreach for PR. Um, we put so much resources, so much time into trying to get some media coverage for our crowdfunding campaign, and what we realized is it's tough. And I mean, you gotta you gotta cast a very very wide net. Um, to maybe get one response, which maybe leads to one article on a small, you know, on a small publication. So I think the other challenge we faced was, you know, as Gary was mentioning, a lot of this, the more uh, significant test results have come out recently. And when we started this five years ago, six years ago, there wasn't, even though we knew it, we knew the writing was on the wall, there weren't as many publications that were available to get awareness around this type of product. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, you're, when you're early, it's tough too, right? You have to wait for the information, the people in the market to catch up a little bit sometimes. Um, so tell me uh, like some of the challenges of the sourcing journey before we get into, okay, now you get, you have to, you have another, uh, you know, distribution that you have to worry about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, sourcing sp uh, particularly for. Yeah. Like just creating the product. What are some oh, of the challenges? Um, it doesn't sound like an easy product to create. No, so uh, the, it comes down even to for the engineers end. at Cal Poly. Yeah, um, it you know the getting the like we're saying before, getting the composition of materials and metals was was the first challenge. 
but then getting suppliers who could be reliable that can give us quality and the same quality of product. That was one of the challenges that we faced was getting the same quality of whether it be a, a particular metal or a particular piece, getting the same exact quality every single time for a good price. So that was, uh, we've gone through suppliers uh, anywhere in Europe to some here locally. Uh, so it was a, a variety of different methods, a variety, some were word of mouth, some of, some of it was, hey, you know, I know this particular manufacturer here that makes something similar. Um, so it was a lot of trial and error that, that got us there. The communication, it, I think, is probably the biggest challenge initially when you're dealing with overseas suppliers. I mean, aside from the time delay and the language barrier, it's just trying to convey your message, you know, mostly, well, almost entirely virtually, um, and, you know, trying to get that communication back and forth. It just, it takes time. So, what? tell me about the decision to launch another Kickstarter and another product, right? Because you could focus on the laptop case, or there's probably cell phone cases or probably accessories. You can branch out in a, a number of different things. What made you make the decision to, okay, we're, we want to do another product? Um, I, I think it, was, it goes, some, a lot, large majority of it goes back to what you're talking about before as far as uh, kids, right? Kids aren't necessarily using laptops. Um, maybe now it's a little. That's a little. It has changed. iPads. iPads, <laughs> right? But um, but all kids have cell phones, and so for us it was very much okay. You know what? This this protects the laptop case. Definitely worked for for um, older individuals, but we're not really helping or able to assist um, children today. So yeah. how can we drive it? Drive the product in a way where we can help some of the the newer generation. Yeah, I mean it's and we had so many. Sorry, yeah, we no, had so ahead. many requests with the laptop case. Um, we just had so many customers requesting the cell phone case that, that yeah. like we realized, okay, I mean there's there's all the proof we need. Our customers are already asking us for a cell phone case. So. Yeah, what's your method for launching a product now? Because then it sounds like you did the crowdfunding, which is smart, right? The, just you're funding it with pre-sales and. Also, they're voting with their wallet that they want it. Um, you have hundreds of products now. Tell me about the, what was the next one after laptop, cell phone. What was the next product and then how you, you decided to release it? So it's funny because uh, when we came, so the next product was our, ta was our tablet cases. And we actually, we had that conversation. Should we go back to Kickstarter, Indiegogo? Because it's a good way to get visibility. It's a great way to get visibility. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, we decided that you know, with the current um, following that we have, that we can just release it through our, our current channels and and be successful that way. Yeah. Uh, I think Carrie and I still have a, a little bit of a soft spot for crowdfunding, um, just because even if it's not from a from a backing a financial backing standpoint, you, get you have a higher higher opportunity for. Um, a, vibe, a product going viral. Yeah. I think I think it's awesome for, you know, a new brand trying to get launched or if you're launching a, a whole new product. Um, so, you know, like our tablet case, which is right here, was almost like a logical iteration of the cell phone case. Um, it was like our cell phone case made a little bigger, just like the iPad was a, <laughs> a cell phone made a little bit bigger. Um, How many colors do you so have with that, that one? This one, we have two right now. We have... Um, because when you held that up, I didn't even think about it. You could have infinite number of colors. Too many decisions. We definitely can. And we have so why, why those two? Too. Why those two colors? Oh, um, you know, we found for sure this will always be one of our colors is black with black. a white stitch. It's just come to be our signature yeah. pattern and style. Um, and we've also found that, I mean, it's always going to be our biggest seller. Yeah. Um, and red, we felt like is a good, I mean, not we felt like just from, you know, customer feedback, we know that it's a pretty good neutral color for mm. um, women, but also, you know, of all ages, um, but it's not too feminine. So if we, now if we have to pick two, it's going to be black and red. Yeah. This is just, just about everyone uses this. Um, if you want something a little different, that's not too girly, but it's still maybe a little bit more feminine. And I mean, I definitely rock the red as well. Yeah. Um, you know. 
just seems to be our, our two most popular. Go to. Do you, um, so you were saying when you had enough uh, base at this point, you could release another product, you can get feedback. Um, how do you do that with the list? Do you have, um, do you release a survey? Do you get on the phone? What, what's your process uh, for the next, for that product? So you're looking at your customer service department for the, uh, <laughs> the first like two years of, yeah. our, of Safe Sleeves existence. So having that, you know, as much as that, you know, I would recommend trying to move, remove yourself as a, as a owner of the company from customer service. I would also highly recommend doing it for as long as you possibly can because you will understand your customer, yeah. right? Um, there's no better way to understand your customers. So it was really just through the conversations. Yeah. What were you hearing? What were they saying? Uh, well, I mean, so initially when we had the laptop case, I, I can't even tell you the number of people that were asking me about a cell phone case. Right. Um, and so, you know, it was just through doing customer service, it was like, okay, we should probably do a cell phone case. Um, and then that, you know, still doing customer service through some of that turned into a tablet case. Um, feedback about color, uh, materials, design. I mean, one thing I realized, and this goes back to crowdfunding as well, is just how willing people are to help and how much they want to help. They want to be involved in your cause if mm. you just explain to them what the cause is. Yeah. Um, and they're more than willing to help to the point where they, they feel involved. Um, so, you know, it was just being transparent with our customers and, and potential customers and letting them know that, hey, we're growing, we want to improve. So, you tell us how, and we'll make it happen. Um, how does the to... how does the cell phone case when you first created different now, or is it the same? Do you have to change it based off feedback, or not at all? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Just like everything else we do, whether it's yeah. shielding material, uh, I don't know, uh, based on the like we're talking about before, the shielding material, um, or any of our products, we're constantly making changes, improvements. Um, adding additional functionality, sometimes um, taking functionality away if it's something that you know is a matter feature that people don't necessarily need and want. Um, so the cell phone case has gone through many iterations. Mm. The latest being um, our detachable cell phone case. So initially they were all the the cases were like your traditional wallet uh, case yeah. were attached. Yeah. So they were uh, attached, but this one is actually um, has a magnetic. Hmm attachment feature so you can basically we have this and you have vent mounts or car mounts so if you're in your car you can remove it put it on your dash oh it's a magnetic car mount oh yeah, that's cool so this is a desk mount which uh spoiler alert for anyone mm -hmm. watching will be coming out with something like this pretty soon which i find myself i would I, I find myself using every day on my desk um basically i take my phone yeah I actually case. Yeah, I detach it, and then this just sits on my desk. You can adjust it; it's magnetic, hmm. so it easily, you know, goes on and off, and it's super secure. So we have some this kind of technology in our in the car too. We have vent mounts that go in the air vent. We have um, an adhesive style that can stick to just about any surface. Hmm. So uh, that was a big change. We also went uh, initially we only had credit card um, credit card slots. Then we went to a credit card wallet. Um, so there's a pocket for cash as well. Yeah. So there's a the regular card slots here, um, which they, these have been improved and reinforced also, um, and we added a pouch here. You probably can't really see that. Yeah, I can there's see more it. storage in here. It's you know more secure. Another example, we uh, this the magnetic latch now magnetizes to the back, so it stays out of the way when you're, you know, when your case is open. Um, hmm. It's interesting yeah, because lots of little things. yeah, <laughs> well that's that's why I asked because. People probably have a lot of suggestions and they mean well, but they don't know that now you have to recreate the whole product and order a whole new batch of them. And it's not so, right. it's not as easy as it seems. Oh, yeah, I just want this latch to magnetize. Well, okay, now we got to add this in and redo the product essentially. Right? right. And you realize some customers understand that concept and, you know, they're, you know, just a friendly suggestion. I'd love to see this. And it's funny how some get angry. Like, why don't you make this yeah. for my phone? Like an HTC 10 year ago model that they sold a hundred of. Like, we're sorry. <laughs> I mean, we're doing oh, the best we can. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> that means they're passionate about it, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so 
now you have to order loads of them and you have to now, you know, forecast how many you're going to sell. So for cash flow and all that, right? That can be a challenge. Talk about now. So that kind of talked about the sourcing journey a little bit and creation journey. Talk about the selling journey. Now you, you start to perfect the product. You have to buy a bunch of them. What moved the needle and helped you get them out to have people purchase? Like, hey, tell me about the evolution a little bit. So you, you know, crowdfunding to start and then what's the next evolution? So from a marketing perspective, just how we kind of drove that traffic and those sales, um, it's, we realized it's everything. It's not one mm -hmm. silver bullet. It's, we do SEO. Um, we have, you know, someone on retainer for SEO. We have um, a marketing, a digital marketing partner that runs Facebook ads, Instagram ads, display ads, um, we're doing retargeting ads, we're doing AdWords. And what we found is it really just, everything has to come together and you have to create, I think Tim Ferriss said this originally, which is a uh, surround right. sound effect. So that, you know, you're on face, or you, you know, you, you Google something and, oh, hey, safe sleep. You might not click it, but it's there. And you, you might not remember seeing it, but subconsciously you saw it. Um, then you go on Facebook and someone's talking about safe sleep. Then you go, your favorite YouTuber is doing a safe sleep review. Um, and that surround sound effect is, you know, something we've tried to harness and uh, I think we're doing a pretty good job of, but it's, you know, it's an endless effort. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the additional challenge for, for, you know, any product that, that tries to do something like we do in the sense of entering a market where you're ahead of kind of society responding to it, is you have to do a lot of knowledge education. sharing. Education, yeah. Education, exactly. So that's where we spent a lot of time and, uh, and resources as far as yeah. you know, making sure that we're, we're helping explain why this is important um, and, and making sure that the consumer is educated when they're, um, when they're purchasing. Yeah, I mean, it, there's a downside and upside, right? There's the upside is it differentiates you. The downside is you have to educate people and like, oh, I just want a cell phone case, I don't care. But... Um, right. Uh, what's been the most popular channel that people get it through? Facebook. Facebook, really? Well, they ordering through our website, right? Which we but they Shopify, hear about it through Facebook. But they, yeah, they'll our Facebook ads are the biggest traffic driver and the biggest conversion driver. Yeah. And that's specifically Facebook, not Instagram, because now you you know you can market on Facebook and they'll push it to Instagram, but uh, specifically on the Facebook platform. Yeah. Talk about, you, you mentioned Shopify. What other, what other tools and software do you use to run the business? Ooh. Um, so first of all, within Shopify, we have like probably 30 apps, which yeah. is one thing I love about Shopify. Yeah. What are your favorites? Um, it, our favorite apps? Yeah. Uh, so we have, let's see, uh, our upsell app is probably one of the most powerful that I would recommend. Um, we have an app for man, um, uh, pop up and exit intent pop up. You know, hey, you know, give us your email and we'll give you a discount. Um, what else do we have? The, <laughs> of um, the thirty, it's well. What I love is you know our menu. We didn't love the menu on our website. Uh, we wanted more functionality, so we downloaded an app that we could completely customize our menu how we wanted it to function. Right. Uh, back end stock notifications. Yep. Uh, so on the back end, we got things like stock notifications, uh, things to help us with our customer support, our returns, processing. Um, it's endless. But in addition to Shopify, we are now using SKU Vault for our inventory management, which helps with, um, just gives us better visibility on our inventory, um, helps with kind of projecting, even though LA pretty much built like a whole spreadsheet that I refuse to go away from that <laughs> yeah. but, but Which, yeah. <laughs> for forecasting it's uh his spreadsheet probably it's tailor made for what we need for forecasting our orders and you know with studying industrial engineering and I think just as being an entrepreneur you you are probably lean by nature or at least wanting to be lean hopefully and uh, so we you know over ordering it can be as much of an issue as under ordering totally. um, we're in a place now where, you know, fortunately, it's a great problem to have, but we're, our problem is usually under ordering, not over ordering. So we're now just kind of blanket across the board, bumping up our order 
quantities. Yeah, it's a tough, order. tough dance, right? Because you don't want to overorder your cash flow, but you want to be in supply for your customers. Exactly, especially in the beginning when you're just getting started improving the concept and you, you don't really know. You can only do so much forecasting, right? Um, and cash is probably a little bit tighter. So, What's um, been the top two most else? popular products? I mean, I see like on the site people can go, I mean, it's the, the site is safesleevecases.com, but you know, you have for the iPhone, the iPad, other tablets, Android, other phones, your laptop. What are the top two products? Our cell phone cases? In general, as a category, cell phone cases, um, and then iPhone, and then within iPhone, probably it's always going to be like the most recent um, one, generation before. one generation exactly before the most current iPhone. Mm -hmm. um, and with the current iPhone situation, you know, you've got the iPhone 10, which is a little bit of an exception, um, but then the iPhone 8 and the 8 Plus, we would consider the current generation. So our most popular would be the seven, but at the same time, the six, seven, eight are the same sizes. So as a whole, it's gonna be all of our iPhone cases for the iPhone six, seven, eight. And it's always gonna be black with a white stitch, like I mentioned. And our detachable is now gaining on our non-detachable version, which was previously our most popular. So what did you wanna be when you grew up? <laughs> I'd rather really think you, you know, <laughs> Carrie, for you, you weren't even, you weren't born here, right? And right, I was, I was listen, yeah. reading up, and um, your parents pretty basically came here with nothing, right? And started from scratch. Pretty much, yeah. So what did, yeah, you, what did I, you learn uh, from them? So, yeah, I mean, I, I think I wanted to be an entrepreneur when I, <laughs> like, as a kid, I think I remember, like, it wasn't a want. It was as much as, like, I just thought that was normal because that's what my parents were. Right, they were whatever you're, you're seeing is normal, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I was born in South Africa. I moved here when I was two. So, you know, the U.S. is pretty much all I know. But my culture and my whole family is very much South African. And um, they, yeah, they came here with nothing like a lot of my family that, you know, even if you had money to bring over by the time you're done with the exchange rate and, um, you know, whatever you can bring and taxes and this and that, um, you're pretty much starting from scratch. They didn't have college degrees. And so they went from selling ties, just I don't even know how they stumbled into that, but they were selling ties out of their trunk, out, out of the, uh, the Del Mar Fair, which is like our local city fair that we have here, um, to getting a little kiosk in a mall, which somehow turned into um, a World Cup store when the World Cup was here in 94, and that turned into jewelry. So <laughs> it was, uh, you know, just watching them hustle and, it, like and I now said, you make see. them sell your phone, your cases. <laughs> and, and now they're, my mom is actually out back right now helping us with shipping. So it's awesome. It all comes full circle. And Lay, what about you? What did you want to do? Yeah, it's kind of similar to Carrie's. I don't know if, if, if I had really thought about what I wanted to be, but I felt like it was natural. I mean, my parents growing up had a, had a deli hmm. in a small town. And I remember going to school and I would – my dad, you know, every morning I would have deli sandwich and from like kindergarten going on. That sounds great. First grade going on. But by the time you get to, you know, fifth grade and sixth grade, you're over deli sandwiches. So I would trade them. I would start trading them for, I remember I traded for uh, GoldenEye for Nintendo 64. I traded for <laughs> movies. I traded, I'd have cash. I remember my dad came into my room one day. I had this Folgers coffee, um, like this old Folgers coffee, whatever containers. It's crammed with like dollar bills. My dad's like, what? Where does this come from? Like I'm selling sandwiches at school. So, <laughs> so Pokemon cards, whatever. So, so you, did me, you have to was, work at the deli, growing up? Um, I did work there for a, yeah. like off and on, growing up. Um, not when I was in seventh grade, but off and on. Do they still have it? They do still have it. Okay, so, I want to visit it. Yeah. Where is it? Uh, it's in Sonoma County. Okay, I'm going. Okay. <laughs> That's what I did in college. I actually worked at a well a sub sandwich shop because I just wanted to have the food. So right. you probably hated it by the time you were older, but yeah, I was just getting started. Else. So right, I I just wanted a regular peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but I had a deli sandwich. And I don't like this anymore. <laughs> so um, so where should people check out the deli? Who cares about Safe Sleeve? Let's talk about the deli. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. The deli is in Sebastopol, California. Okay. So Sequoia Mart. So. Burger shop and uh, and the deli. Okay, cool. 
Um, so take us to today. What I don't know if you can reveal what's in the future. What products are you developing now, or are you just going to stick with what you got and just worry about, you know, refining the systems and selling? Uh, yeah, I don't know if we can go into specifics as far as what we're <laughs> releasing, but uh, I can say that I think that what will always be the case is continuing to push with, as we're talking about before, the education piece. Um, continue educating the public and, and anyone that we meet, anyone that comes across our website, as far as you know why this is important. And, and frankly, even if it's something where they decide they don't want the case, it's a matter of being aware of the device you have, the devices you have, and the implications uh, they can, and as some scientists say, will have on your health. Um, that is something that we're going to continue focusing on, uh, continue growing. What's been the most successful non-paid advertising? Like, have you had, like, I know, Carrie, you mentioned YouTube. Um, have there been any influencers that have picked it up, or have you found more the SEO side of the education is, is working better? And maybe it's a little tougher to track than a direct paid advertisement to a sale. But um, have you seen anything, any traction? What's been, the, I guess, the most traction as far as non-paid advertising? I think easy word of mouth. Oh, that's exactly what I was going to say, just word of mouth. Um, it's, it's a funny thing with our cases. I don't know what it is about it. Um, I mean, granted, obviously, we're biased. We think it looks great. But... Somehow when you have this case, people will ask you about it. Hmm. And even though they don't know just by looking at it that it's anti-radiation. So next thing you're telling, explaining to someone and, you know, we've found like it, it's a 30 second elevator pitch that our customers can give to other future customers. And it's just been extremely effective for us. Like hmm. our, our ratio of direct to website orders and um, branded search order. So people coming to the internet to look for safe sleep is probably way higher than you, you would expect to see from uh, just about any direct consumer product. Hmm. Talk about, you know, I always ask this because it's Inspired Insider. What's been, and it could be different for both of you, what's been the lowest moment uh, in the business? And then on the flip side, what's been the proudest moment or milestone? So lowest moment, the first thing that came to mind is not one moment, but the multiple sleepless nights for things like, and I'm not talking about sitting there, you know, coding or setting up an ad campaign. I'm talking about, um, you know, using your, your customer's money or using a loan from family and friends to place an order of in, an inventory order. And knowing that it's with a new factory and ultimately you're depending on you know you're just trusting that they're going to get you the goods because you pay for it all up front before you have anything in hand um so that's more of a stressful side of it low moment i'd say for me just kind of spiritually philosophically as an entrepreneur um i think everyone's going to face that moment of like am i in the right place should i keep going down this path and full steam ahead or should I go get a job? Should I suck it up even though that's not what I wanted to do? I never envisioned myself totally. going to work for someone else. Um, should I? You're like, I could work just, uh, 35 hours, have weekends off, um, paid vacation, or I could work 100 hours or more and yeah, not get paid vacation, not get paid sometimes. Yep. I mean, exactly. you could tell I've never thought about this before, but, uh, but yeah. <laughs> any entrepreneur has, right? Yeah. So, so what I'd do you tell yourself? Yeah, what do you tell yourself in that in that moment where you're like, oh my god, just the journey may be it may be easier, not not more fruitful, but maybe easier on the flip side. What do you tell yourself? You know, I try to flip the how I frame it. I try to reframe it like 180 degrees and basically think of the downside of taking that other path, the mm -hmm. downside of where am I going to be in 10 years if I do go away from my dream and I choose to, you know, do a U-turn and, and go the other way. Um, and that the fear of, you know, being 10 years down the line and saying, like, I never went for it is what just yeah. drives me to keep pushing full steam ahead and 
you know, just trust my gut and keep going with it. Um, I'd rather, I'd rather live, you know, maybe not the successful life that I envision or the, you know, um, whatever it is that I end up envisioning, but I, I rather live the life of trying to achieve that than not trying at all. Totally. Um, what about on the flip side and then, uh, Lay, we'll get to you. What about on the proudest moment? or milestone that you remember that you hit that you were ecstatic about? Um, it's probably when we hit our first kind of, you know, our first day on when I'm, I'm watching sales through Shopify and through Amazon and, and we do a new marketing campaign, we launch a new product. Um, and okay, so specifically when we launched our detachable cases and, you know, again, sleepless nights went into we wanted to do this thing right from the get-go and apply everything we've learned from every other product and you know hit the detachable and hit it hard um and the day we launched we reached uh, we probably exceeded our previous high for sales in a day by three times huh. and that was counting the previous black friday and cyber monday which is always going to be our biggest day um that's probably the first thing that comes to mind um and then it's it's honestly just every day. I, I don't want to sound too corny, but like it's every day that I can come to the office and Alay and I are working side by side. Like we worked, you know, remotely with each other when he was working a full time job, um, and now we can come to our office and our warehouse, and we have all of our product in our warehouse, and we're working side by side, and we have you know we have some awesome help. Um, and so it's it's really every day I come to the office and realize yeah. that. If you continue maybe, to grow, what do you think your next hire will be? We actually just talked about this. Yeah, probably something design on the creative side. Um, so I'm surprised to hear that. Hire, Why? What's up? I'm surprised to hear that actually. Well, so our most recent hire um, has been knocking it out of the park in terms of operations. Everything operations related, that's what she loves and she does it super well. And that was always our first, you know, our first hire would have been that and it was. Um, now that we have that in place, I think the next one would be the creative side. And the reason why is that's curious. So we, again, bootstrap, you know, smaller companies are gonna uh, outsource a lot of work. And, and when you do that, sometimes you hit home runs, sometimes it's not so great. And then you spend a lot of time finding, you know, for one project, someone might work well, but the next time you have a next project, you might not yeah. even find the same person. They may not be available anymore, so you have to find someone Exactly. Else. So for us, it's, you know, we always have an idea and vision of what we want. We just need someone to create it. But now bringing that, that resource in-house where it's like we can just throw our ideas and keep pumping them out, um, it's going to allow us to move a lot faster. Yeah. So, so you guys are the idea and people and you kind of hand it off to that person exactly i think part of that is we're kind of a sucker i know myself at least but i think i speak for late too like we're a sucker for the aesthetics and like so something you know you don't think of it necessarily but this direct to customer retail packaging that we designed yeah um every little you know subtle feature we wanted the unboxing experience to be um you know an impactful experience that matches the quality of our products yeah so something like that is a project and, yeah, um, so you know, kind of meshing the the engineering with the design, get someone in there to to be more hands on with the design. I would just throw it in like a poly bag, like here, you guys have this nice well, case, right? And, like, and, that's, and that's kind of what they're going back to the very beginning, and we're thinking about you know, safe sleeve and, and what we wanted to create. That was very much a part of it. You know, we wanted a product that was absolutely superior when it came to the protection. Uh, functionality right but it came but it also came with additional features additional um capabilities that these other products didn't offer and then it also had a aesthetic feel to totally. the packaging the lifestyle the whole the whole package yeah totally so a lay yeah you know, sorry that, that's and you know because we do digital marketing you constantly need new graphics and images and um you're running different ads and setting up you know new pages and making changes to the website so there's a lot of design involved there totally uh, Alay, what about you? Low point, and then proud moment. Uh, low point, um, I would say, it was probably during 
uh, one of the two uh, crowdsourcing campaigns where mm-hmm. Carrie was mentioning we kind of uh, squeaked by at the last minute. I was like, you know, you, you put all this because there's a lot of work up front. Right. Do a whole lot of work up front, and then you hit go, and you just hope that everything kind of just fires and works. And you're still doing stuff as it's going. Um, but then we made it through, and it was it was great. And then uh, proudest moment would be uh, probably this past year. Everyone, every business has a particular you know milestone. Um, and you know we do this every year. We create a at the beginning of the year, the end of the year, we create a plan for the next year. And uh, and this year's milestone last sorry last year's milestone was a particularly um let's say important one for me and uh we we exceeded that milestone last year and that was that was a moment for me where it was uh i was uh very very uh, proud of that. And that was like a sales a revenue number right it was a revenue number, yeah. yeah what are some things that people should look out for challenges um of having co-founders Right, because some people run their company, some people have two co-founders. You know, I see, like you were saying, there's an advantage, right? But then there's other challenges. The advantage, you know, like you may be having a low moment, Carrie, and then like you may be like, you know what, you may be at just pumping and, and having a lot of energy and kind of taking that person up, right? Kind of like a workout partner. What are some of the challenges people should look out for navigating with with a co-founder? I figure I could ask that because you're both to get together. So, yeah. uh, like, I will say it, it's funny. It's actually something that I read this article way back when, when Carrie and I were working remotely, and uh, it talked about how, uh, you know, your business partner is like your significant other. Totally. Yeah. And I told Carrie this, and we, we you know, we laughed about it. Uh, but it's it's very much true. It's you know, even in a significant other, you, you want someone. There's going to be peaks and valleys. And, you know, the, the understanding is, you know, you pull them up when they're down and they pull you up when you're down and you, it's a yin yang thing. And I think that very much works for carrying myself. Uh, but, you know, going as far as, uh, like, what do you tend to disagree on? What do we disagree on? Yeah. Man, he's been doing this for so long and I agree with Ale a hundred percent. And I actually knew that he was going to say that before he said <laughs> it, which also speaks to our partnership. Um, but I think we've gotten to the point where we just understand each other so well that like, <laughs> like if you are, we might disagree on things, but yeah. if you already know how the other person's gonna. Well, that's what I mean. Team. You may know ahead of time. I'm gonna bring this up. Ale is gonna shut it down because he doesn't like blah blah blah. <laughs> what do you know that you will disagree? I mean, you'll you'll work through it. But what do you know you will actually not agree on something, and you'll have to kind of argue. You both will have to argue mm-hmm. with each other, in, not in like a. A nasty way, but I mean the one that I could think of, and this has—I don't know if this has really happened recently, but uh, is eighty-twenty rule. The perfectionist will come out and say, you know, one of us is like ready to hit go. Let's just move forward. Let's get it out there. We'll work out the kinks after it's launched. Just go. Uh, and one of us will be like, well, hold on. Have we have we crossed our T's, dotted the I's? Have we checked everything we possibly can before we letting you know go out the door? That that conversation has gotten. I would even say probably heated at, at Is that one of you more like which which one of you is more the perfectionist and which one of you is more let's just go? So I'm gonna let Carrie answer. <laughs> well, I consider myself a perfectionist, which is the funny part. But in our partnership, I don't know if this just means Alay is like too much of a perfectionist or what, but it's more so I'd say more so I'm more like ready, fire, yeah. aim. Yeah. Whereas LA is a little bit more calculated, but then again, there are examples where it's the opposite. It's so the opposite. I think we just have our. If I could think of a specific example. Your moment. Um. Can you think of any specific examples like detachable case? I think we're both on the same page. Let's just go for it. I can think of. Uh, so you always try to hit. You always try to hit a mark. Um, so let's say it's, you know we release cases for Apple products and you know Apple leaks information or they do or someone else does about suspicions as far as what the next product's going to be and there was a particular time and I think it was during our Kickstarter campaign where we were going to li- release we were trying to hit the mark for a product that Apple was just about to release right um, they announced it but as far as specifications it wasn't necessarily out yet and we uh, I think I was more gung-ho on the hey you know what let's just go for it 
um, it was like probably one of the few times where I was like, let's just go for it, order more, and just get it out there. And Carrie was like, well, what? Because it wasn't his supplier, I think, at the time, too. And we didn't know. If, we hadn't even seen a sample, I don't think, of I don't the think case. So. <laughs> um, but, I mean, it's, it's things like that. I think the reason why it works is, as Carrie was mentioning, there's times where it flops. One of us will be more conservative, one of us will be more gung-ho. Right. And it works out well because, you know, typically the person that's more gung-ho has been maybe more involved. Um, in whatever that project is, whatever that whatever that thing is, and the other person isn't. But the good thing is, because they haven't been as involved and they're more removed, they have they sometimes majority of the time bring up good questions and good points where it's like, okay, you know what? If we actually these are two things that we did overlook, but if we get that in now, then you know we are ready for like an eighty twenty rule, just push out and go for totally. it. Totally, that's true. I think I think it comes down to like the fallacy of sunken costs. I think it's called where basically you've you've already invested so much in it so if it's your baby it's your project you're you know for example like if i'm i'm working on something like a new packaging design and a is not involved in it at all um and then i say hey here it is like we're going to get them printed and um i just want to I've, I've been so in the weeds with this thing that i know it's perfect and i know it's ready and then he looks and he's like well what about this this and that and uh I think that goes both ways to Lay's point. Right. Just, if you're the one that's in it, you're gonna you you don't want to hear any feedback. Yeah. You feel like you thought of everything, but that can be a good thing. Totally. No, I I ask that because it is like a marriage, and um, it's it's not necessarily always an easy road to navigate. You know, you have to talk about the decision making and everything like that. So, yeah, I appreciate you sharing some of the. Uh, ways you navigate that but i want to thank you guys both this has been awesome i want everyone to go and check out safesleevecases.com anywhere else we should point people online uh besides the website just our social channels you can follow us on facebook at safe sleeve and instagram at safe sleeve as well cool check them out so you don't get radiated by your phones your tablets your laptops and your kids don't either and uh, I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. You know what I just thought of, Jeremy? Yeah. Sorry. Um, Go on. We'll throw up a discount code, too, for anyone listening, and we'll make it Rise25 right behind you, and it'll okay. we'll be 25% off. Yeah, so Rise25, 25% off. Very generous of you. And put that, whoever's doing the show notes of this, put the Rise25 code on that page so people can, uh, can grab it. So thanks, guys. All right. Thank you. What I got...